Hello everyone. Uh, today's uh, lecture is going to be on orofacial pain. Um, one of the most uh, challenging clinical issues uh, dentist confronts uh, is the patient with uh, a persistent orofacial pain uh, without uh, any obvious uh, physical cause. Um, patients with uh, persistent orofacial pain uh, seek consultation from many dentists, clinicians, uh, general physicians and uh, undergo multiple uh, unnecessary procedures uh, before receiving a correct diagnosis and uh, appropriate treatment. So uh, clinicians who are unfamiliar with uh, the different types of orofacial pain uh, you know, uh, but with limited knowledge about it uh, might uh, provide uh, some form of inappropriate treatment or a uh, treatment that is not directed towards the actual cause of the pain in the patient. Uh, the spectrum uh, of orofacial pain is such that um, you will as in your life as a practicing uh, uh, dental specialist will come across some form of uh, orofacial pain. It can be a neuralgic pain, it can be a neuropathic pain, it can be a, a burning pain. Um, and uh, it is very important that uh, uh, to avoid uh, unnecessary and inappropriate diagnosis. And the key to that lies mostly in understanding uh, uh, the or understanding pain, uh, especially orofacial pain, and uh, the different forms of it. So these are your learnings and uh, let's just um, clarify a few things because there are going to be a few terminologies that we are going to be using very frequently within our topic. So uh, let me just uh, start off by uh, uh, saying the definition of pain uh, which is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage uh, described in uh, terms of such damage uh, which was coined by International Association for Study of Pain. Uh, pain arises from the word uh, punia which in Latin means uh, punishment. After so, this there are a lot of uh, uh, different uh, uh, definitions that has been uh, coined out for uh, pain uh, but uh, that one is the one which is most uh, popularly used. Terminologies that we need to get familiar with are um, al allodynia, uh, which is uh, pain that occurs without nauseous simulation at the site of pain, analgesia, which is absence of pain, anesthesia, which is absence of all sensation, dysthesia, which is unpleasant abnormal sensation, hyperalgesia, where there is increased sensitivity to stimulation uh, pain, and uh, inflammatory pain, pain that emanates from tissue that is inflamed. Neuropathic pain, uh, pain that is generated uh, within the nervous system due to some abnormality among nervous uh, structures. Nociception, the mechanism that provides for the reception and uh, conversion of noxious or potential noxious stimuli into neural impulses. Uh, we would have come across this uh, nociception, nociception receptors a uh, lot about in uh, physiology and uh, anatomy. And uh, paresthesia, which is an abnormal sensation where spontaneous, where, whether it is spontaneous or evoked. Uh, visceral pain, which is deep, deep somatic pain that originates from visceral structures. To move on to characteristics of pain, um, you are familiar, you will be familiar about these characteristics of pain. Um, uh, when uh, we would have already discussed this a little bit about this while we did case sheet. Uh, while we are taking history of presenting illness, there are there are certain criterias that we uh, put forth as questions uh, in when we uh, try to take history of pain. Uh, for example, like intensity of pain. Uh, generally, uh, the intensity of pain is categorized uh, in terms of dentistry, mild, moderate, severe. But the intensity of pain can also be uh, can also be uh, measured or we can try to measure it uh, using various scales which we will see as we go on further. Uh, what we have to remember here is pain is a very subjective, pain is a subjective symptom and uh, it is one of the most important symptoms why most of the times, uh, let us say over 80% of your patients uh, come to you uh, because it's a very important symptom for an 
uh, existing even patients identify uh, with an existing problem only when uh, pain arises as a symptom and sometimes in rare occasions when there is any uh, structural or uh, you know aesthetic uh, uh, defect or manage uh, or a problem that arises so pain is a very important uh, component here and um, um, uh, intensity so like i told you it's a it's a very subjective thing also we do not have any specific apparatus or we do not have any scientific way per se uh, although there are certain ways uh, in terms of uh, uh, studying the centers of uh, where the pain is arising from uh, in our uh, how it is per in which part of the brain it is perceived with functional mri and other uh, scientific advancements but there are still no way of scientifically measuring uh, pain so it is done by various uh, scales and uh, here we have to uh, look at other factors so history taking history uh, of the patient uh, history of the patient and uh, clinical examination uh, and ruling out any physical factors plays a very key important role in terms of uh, diagnosing most of the uh, pain uh, other than uh, dental pain so apart from intensity we also have to uh, localize the pain whether to see whether it is poorly localized because in terms of superficial pain it is better localized than in uh, deep pain and uh, visceral pain is often uh, one of the contributing characteristics for pain is uh, psycho psychological uh, you know con attribution or contribution so an emotional accompaniment must also be measured uh, psychological factors should also be taken into consideration um, we all know like uh, although uh, too much of emotional distress uh, we know that uh, scientifically uh, too much of emotional distress uh, uh, patient tend to hold uh, their heart and uh, sit down as if they are crushed uh, although we actually know that there is nothing actually uh, hurting uh, uh, the heart physically but the emotional accompaniment that comes with it so uh, psychological component can be a very effective uh, contributing factor to uh, orofacial pain and the influence of the uh, damage on the intensity of pain uh, we have to see the rate of uh, tissue injury and the intensity of pain so i am wise types of pain uh, you can basically categorize it into acute and chronic based on duration and based on the cause you can whether you can categorize it as somatic pain neuropathic pain or psychogenic pain. and uh, depending on the quality of pain you can uh, say whether it is sharp whether it is pricking uh, type of pain and it is whether it is well localized these are all very typical quality of uh, pulpal periapical uh, type of pain and uh, sometimes dull aching throbbing and poorly localized and uh, depending on the pattern whether it is intermittent or continuous and depending on the location whether uh, the uh, it's localized diffused or referred so superficial pain tend to be you know uh, arise from uh, the skin and uh, the pain is typically simulated as a pin prick uh, pricking type of pain or a pinching type of pain whereas uh, deep pain is generally arise deep pain generally arises from connective tissue and uh, it usually uh, is manifested as muscle cramps and headache Uh, neuropathic pain uh, generally arises from nerves and uh, neural tissue and uh, and the uh, characteristic is neuropathy neuroma and nerve injury due to uh, we'll see little about uh, neuropathic pain and uh, other forms of pain as we go on further so all of this basically falls under the category of somatic pain and uh, finally there is visceral pain uh, which arises from the viscera and uh, the most uh, common causes are uh, the colic uh, ulcerative type of pain and appendicitis appendicitis type of pain uh, moving on to classification of orofacial pain uh, you can basically categorize it into two axes uh, one axis one is the physical component and axis two is the psychological component uh, axis one uh, where we have where we can categorize the somatic pain where in superficial somatic pain you have cutaneous pain and mucogingival pain and uh, deep somatic pain you have musculoskeletal pain where you have uh, muscle uh, pain myofascial pain temporomandibular joint pain uh, osseous and periosteal pain soft tissue connective uh, tissue pain and uh, periodontal dental pain 
and in visceral uh, you have pulpal uh, vascular neurovascular and uh, the visceral mucosal in neuropathic you have episodic neuropathic pain where you have uh, new the typical neuralgia such as trigeminal and glossopharyngeal neuralgia and and uh, postherpetic neuralgia and you have neurovascular pain also apart from that you also have continuous neuropathic pains where uh, it is manifested in uh, uh, herpetic neuralgia and uh, uh, different atypical odontology and sympathetically maintained pain in axis 2 like i mentioned before uh, you have uh, psychological conditions that contribute uh, to pain such as anxiety disorders somatoform disorders and other conditions which are stress related and psychological you have an entire uh, uh, you have an entire chapter or now uh, even you have a textbook dedicated to it they are called psychosomatic disorders where you find the psychological components that contributes to different uh, types of pain okay to measure intensity i told you because it is very subjective uh, you do not have any scientific uh, instrument to actually measure uh, uh, to actually measure pain per se uh, it is only measured uh, you know uh, via questioning so in that we have various uh, uh, you know various scales that we use uh, the one which we commonly use is a visual analog scale score uh, visual analog scale is different and the visual analog score uh, scale va score is different uh, va scale generally refers to if you can see there will be a list of 10 smileys and uh, you have to uh, based on the emoticon you choose which category you fall in uh, uh, amount of distress you are in whereas va score uh, you ask the patient to score their score the intensity of pain between 0 to 10 uh, 0 being the most uh, the least or uh, no pain from 10 being the uh, most severe or highest intensity pain which the patient cannot uh, handle and uh, although it's a it's a it's it's a very easy and it's a very direct straightforward way it's not very confusing for the patient to understand and uh, it is not that much of time taking so we generally go for BAS scale or BAS score uh, in terms of measurement of pain but in most of uh, understanding in most chronic pains uh, we, the orofacial pain specialists generally tend to go with the McGill pain questionnaire which is a 78 adject, uh, which uses 78 different adjectives to uh, describe pain which is, gives us a much more kind of an uh, which narrows it down uh, to a certain extent as to what might be the pain and what might be the source of pain in terms of, especially in terms of chronic uh, pain related illnesses uh, which can be uh, very big and uh, which cannot be that easily uh, you know identified in the first round of uh, in uh, questionnaire or investigations you have other numerical scales such as the multi-axial uh, assessment of pain which is mab uh, which is in 61 item questionnaire but uh, what we have to remember here uh, in terms of dentistry we use uh, uh, visual analog scale or score and uh, McGill uh, questionnaire like I told you orofacial pain uh, history is a very important component so in chief complaint uh, history of present illness we ask the patient about the location of pain about the onset the characteristics of pain the aggravating and relieving factors and uh, whether there is any past consultations or treatment that has been carried out for management of this pain uh, it is important that we also uh, correlate if possible with the past medical history and review of systems and psychological uh, of the pain physical examination uh, where we it is important that we inspect the head and neck uh, region for uh, the regional anatomy for any pathologies palpation of the masticatory muscles and uh, assessment of the range of uh, mandibular movements uh, uh, that is directly uh, indirectly investigating uh, the muscles and uh, the temporomandibular joint uh, which are responsible for uh, the uh, depression and elevation and other movements of the jaw and uh, cranial nerve examinations and uh, general inspection of uh, uh, ear nose and uh, throat uh, because uh, because of the close uh, relationship of the uh, ENT apparatus with the orofacial complex sometimes uh, there is a referred pain and uh, it is generally orofacial pain is mistaken to be an ENT problem and ENT pain can be mistaken to be a orofacial uh, problem uh, 
and examination and palpation of uh, intraoral soft tissues and uh, examination of teeth uh, periodontium and uh, up so there are uh, differential different different uh, uh, differential diagnosis that you can go through for orofacial pain the ones which we are uh, currently seeing on our screen are, are put in general terms so for example if there is uh, in, in intracranial pain disorders it can be due to a neoplasm aneurysm an uh, abscess or a hemorrhage uh, intracranial hemorrhage or a hematoma or an edema uh, which uh, most of it uh, um, uh, most of the later uh, falls under the category of trauma and uh, trauma to the head and primary headache disorders such as uh, migraine and uh, other variants of migraine such as and cluster headaches uh, paroxysmal uh, hemicrania cranial arteritis and uh, neurovascular disorders such as uh, cartodynia and tension type headaches and uh, then you have uh, neurogenic pain disorders where you have uh, trigeminal glossopharyngeal nerves uh, superior uh, laryngeal neuralgias and continuous pain disorders such as <clears throat> postherpetic neuralgia and sympathetically maintained pain and you have other intraoral pain disorders uh, arising from dental pulp periodontium mucogingival tissue and uh, and you also have burning mouth syndrome and uh, temporomandibular disorders where pain arises from the masticatory muscles tmj and associated structures and uh, associated structures which i have mentioned already previously before such as the uh, ocular that is eyes ent ear nose throat lymph nodes and salivary glands Uh, treatment for most of the pain generally falls into uh, first educating the patient making them aware of the cause for the pain and counseling them uh, counseling uh, uh, is, has become as gain more and more ground in terms of treatment of pain because uh, there is a certain uh, we have identified that there is a psychological uh, factor that is contributing to orofacial pain so it is Uh, over a period of time uh, since you see uh, if, if we take an evolution of the management of uh, pain uh, psychological uh, management uh, uh, let it be um, uh, in terms of treatment uh, via pharmacy formula pharmacologically or non pharmacologically via cognitive and behavior management uh, all these uh, you know relaxation therapy and all these they all are uh, they all have started uh, gaining more ground in terms of treatment of uh, uh, in terms of components of treatment of pain apart from our regular uh, pharmacological and uh, you know other modes of uh, physical modes of treatment of pain okay let us uh, start with uh, facial neuralgias uh, so when we talk about neuralgia it is important to understand uh, neuropathic pain uh, neuropathic pain is uh, fundamentally uh, it's different from uh, somatic pain uh, in which there is a nociceptor uh, simulation uh, whereas it is not necessary in neuropathic uh, pain uh, whereas the tissue and nerve injury may be an initi- uh, may initiate the process that uh, lead to pain and uh, neuropathic pain uh, persists uh, once the initial injury heals and uh, therein lies the diagnostic uh, challenge uh, since in most cases uh, neuropathic pain there is no evidence of uh, ongoing tissue injury or inflammation or anything to substantiate uh, the pain which can uh, often lead treatments to you know direct red disease uh, that uh, generally do not exist um, uh, one example we can give is endodontic uh, treatment without any pulpal injury or tooth extraction where a patient might typically keep pointing you towards a particular tooth a tooth or a dental area and saying there is pain 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 and we might eventually come up with a uh, this thing um, and uh, eventually go up to treating uh, it pulpally and periodontally uh, without understanding the component really and uh, allodynia and mechanical hyperalgesia are uh, common features of uh, neuropathic pain Uh, the patient experiences increased pain due to noxious stimuli as well as pain to non noxious stimulation also the two general types of neuropathic pain exists one is the paroxysmal type of pain and continuous uh, type of pain and uh, and uh, paroxysmal pain refers to sudden uh, brief uh, which uh, brief pain which uh, only uh, exists from seconds to minutes and uh, it is evoked by a very light touch and uh, movement of the affected area 
whereas uh, continuous uh, neuropathic pain has a constant burning or a stinging quality that may have uh, uh, greater periods uh, may, uh, that may that may prolong for greater greater periods with uh, lesser intensity and uh, unlike uh, somatic pain uh, paroxysmal neuropathic pain is uh, generally characterized by pain free intervals and therefore does not exhibit the same uh, uh, same level as to pain uh, by you know simulation or provocation and uh, neuropathic pain also does not necessarily occur in the area that evokes that pain and simulated and uh, it can also uh, exist in areas outside the uh, area of cause and uh, moving on to uh, neuralgias uh, uh, we'll go a little bit about uh, trigeminal neuralgia where we'll start with the clinical features uh, it's an excruciating uh, debilitating orofacial pain illness uh, it is largely recognized as the one of the most uh, painful human condition uh, initially uh, um, trigeminal neuralgia used to be called a tick dollar axe uh, owing to the facial expression of the wince ones uh, that often accompanies the painful episode and uh, you can actually you can actually visually see the pain uh, manifesting in the patient's uh, facial expression and uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's quite rare it's not usually very common and uh, uh, the risk uh, being uh, in very elderly people uh, where the incidence uh, raises highly and uh, uh, it is it it is a very uh, common kind of neuralgic pain that uh, trigeminal neuralgia that a dentist uh, would uh, generally come across uh, and uh, might mistake it for any uh, dental pain. Uh, the pain is generally uh, described as stabbing, shooting, electric shock like pain that lasts from seconds to minutes, and most of the time the patient is aware of the trigger of pain. such as light touch to an intraoral or extraoral region or facial or tongue movements the trigeminal neuralgia is, uh, uh, is the quintessential uh, neuropathic pain uh, which is uh, characterized by profound uh, uh, allodynia the pain often radiates to the area outside the trigger zone or the area uh, which you know kind of simulates or provocates the pain and the frequency of uh, or this trigeminal neuralgia is variable from severe episodes daily to every few months and in rare case in progressive cases the pain becomes uh, a little continuous also and uh, pain is almost uh, always unilateral and uh, occurs nearly, uh, nearly equally in uh, maxillary and mandibular trigeminal uh, divisions less commonly in the ophthalmic divisions uh, if we have to take the order it is most common in the mandibular maxillary and ophthalmic it also occurs nearly in uh, among equally among males and females uh, though some reports uh, say that uh, incidence is more higher in uh, females uh, trigeminal trigeminal neuralgia uh, uh, you can categorize it as primary and secondary Uh, secondary trigeminal trigeminal neuralgia occurs because of some identified uh, abnormality such as intra or extra cranial tumor and uh, space uh, multiple sclerosis um, and uh, primary trigeminal, uh, trigeminal neuralgia occurs in the absence of identified cause most uh, most likely uh, most of the trigeminal cases are primary primary uh, neuro trigeminal neuralgia usually occurs in individuals over 50 years of age uh, very less commonly seen in younger adults and uh, the suspicion of underlying illness such as tumor multiple sclerosis uh, increase in uh, younger patients with uh, trigeminal neuralgia and evol- uh, their evaluation uh, should be carried uh, intracranial evaluation should be carried um, with a ct or an mri in cases of younger uh, uh, individuals with uh, uh, who so who show symptom of uh, trigeminal neuralgia uh, when we talk about uh, etiology uh, most cases of trigeminal neuralgia are primary in nature and without uh, any identified underlying cause and although a universal etiologic theory for trigeminal neuralgia does not actually exist and, uh, and there is a little bit uh, uh, disagreement that it is uh, actually a neuropathic uh, pain disorder uh, resulting from altered sensory processing um, 
but uh, it is mostly referred to as a commonly accepted but not proven etiology is the presence of uh, abnormal vascular anatomy most commonly in the superior cerebellar artery which uh, uh, which kind of which tends to press over uh, the trigeminal root or the ganglion in the uh, posterior cranial fossa the neurosurgical correction by microvascular decompression has been widely used uh, for the correction for uh, vascular abnormality uh, this occurs due to demyelination which is often been suggested as the underlying pathology uh, that also leads to abnormal electrical excitability and pain uh, although sound evidence to uh, support this uh, theory is sometimes lacking but uh, the number of cases that has been uh, done with electrical demyelination sometimes contributes to the fact but it is not always the same scenario uh, this can be uh, very evidently demonstrated with MRI uh, but sometimes you can find this symptom absolutely missing uh, in, uh, in uh, certain cases secondary trigeminal neuralgia develops as a result of an underlying disorder such as an intra extracranial tumor or a space occupying lesion multiple sclerosis or trauma any history of trauma common intracranial tumors uh, that can lead to trigeminal neuralgia are generally pituitary adenoma meningioma glioma or uh, acoustic neuroma and uh, in such cases the underlying disorder is presumably uh, underlying disorder presumably leads to and uh, ectopic uh, electrical activity uh, caused by uh, a direct pressure or demyelination of the nerve fibers and uh, approximately approximately uh, roughly about uh, 10% of patients with multiple sclerosis develop trigeminal neuralgia which might be an initial symptom of undiagnosed uh, multiple sclerosis so it, it so uh, a trigeminal neuralgic uh, neuralgia a diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia can be a key factor uh, in terms of uh, unidentified multiple sclerosis in uh, let us say uh, let us say roughly about 5 to 10 of every 100 patients uh, that you come across with uh, trigeminal uh, neuralgia whether it uh, develops in an uh, younger individual uh, the suspicion of uh, an underlying disease is to be uh, investigated uh, to be investigated thoroughly uh, so it's a Trigeminal neuralgia is basically a clinical diagnosis and uh, it is based mostly on exclusively on history and physical examination. Uh, imaging studies uh, can only may further identifying the underlying disorders uh, but uh, here the key here is history and examination of the patient. Uh, paroxysmal unilateral pain which is described as sharp stabbing or electric uh, pain with brain free individuals and identified trigger zone or very essential features in terms of uh, diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia. The possibility for uh, local somatic disease which are odontogenic origin should be very carefully evaluated and uh, though uh, odontogenic somatic pain is unlikely to be characteristic, characterized as intermittent episodes of pain. A complete uh, cranial nerve examination should also be performed and uh, uh, suspicion for trigeminal neuralgia secondary to tumor a vascular abnormality or multiple, multiple sclerosis should be increased when uh, there are other abnormalities that are identified during a neurologic uh, examination uh, because the condition is uh, intermittent and paroxysmal the physical pain is typically uh, completely normal and uh, uh, trigeminal uh, sensory thresholds are generally normal and symmetric except during a pain episode where uh, there exists a profound uh, allodynia. Uh, there are generally no signs of somatic or inflammatory uh, injury to the uh, nerve. Diagnostic imaging such as CT, MRI, uh, especially in multiple sclerosis, uh, should be performed for all patients with uh, trigeminal neuralgia, especially those who develop uh, symptoms after 50 years of age. And uh, Management of uh, trigeminal neuralgia um, um, uh, can categorize the severe medical, surgical, uh, surgical modalities of treatment uh, uh, that are available for it. All therapies are directed towards reducing uh, nerve excitability, which is found to be uh, the uh, you know one of the core, uh, one of the most common reasons for neuralgic uh, trigeminal neuralgic pain. Uh, 
medical therapy is preferred uh, uh, as the initial treatment for those who can tolerate uh, medications because these medications come uh, are very strong and come with a lot of uh, you know truckload of uh, um, uh, side effects or adverse effects um, so uh, membrane stabilizing medications such as uh, carbamazepine gabapentin valproic acid phenytoin baclofen are commonly used uh, alone or in combinations depending upon the patient's uh, you know uh, clinical presentation of the pain uh, they all uh, act to reduce excitability by uh, you know modulating the conductance of ions across the nerve membrane uh, medication should be prescribed only by clinicians only by uh, clinicians who have experienced uh, you know who have experience and understanding of uh, their you know their mechanism of action and, and uh, their side effects uh, because uh, let me take uh, something like uh, gabapentin or pregabalin as an example where their uh, you know their kind of use uh, you know kind of like you know where uh, they when they are not properly monitored and used in an already depressed patients uh, you know can uh, you know can lead to you know suicidal uh, tendencies in patients so uh, and uh, patients so very lot of uh, very typical intolerance especially to pregabalin and gabapentin uh, they are very commonly prescribed in uh, you know in uh, uh, neuro department and uh, uh, especially in spinal cord injury uh, they come with a lot of adverse effects uh, especially can push patient into very acute uh, depression um, so it is very important that we understand uh, the uh, mechanism of action of these uh, drugs and uh, their uh, potential side effects uh, hence we only use them uh, accordingly uh, with the patients uh, correlating it with the patients uh, you know uh, clinical features and diagnosis and uh, medical treatments provide uh, generally a uh, complete and acceptable uh, amount of relief mostly in 75% of patients sometimes patients also enjoy complete remission of pain and uh, minority might be unresponsive uh, after prolonged medical therapy so if for example uh, if we are going to prescribe uh, uh, carbamazepine we generally do not uh, jump right away to the maximum dosage level that which is especially uh, somewhere around a daily allowed a recommended dose of uh, let us say 1200 uh, mg 1000 to 1200 mg for a normal uh, for healthy uh, uh, adult uh, we do not straight away go to 1000 we generally gradually build up the dose uh, to reach the pain threshold level uh, and once the threshold level is uh, achieved we tend to stop there uh, for example if the patient's pain uh, or the symptom pain symptoms alleviated when a patient takes a divided dose of let us say 600 milligrams of uh, uh, carbamazepine and uh, we stop the dosage there we slowly build it up from uh, 200 uh, or let us say 400 in two divided doses then we make it 600 in uh, three divided doses or two divided doses uh, as in a daily on a daily basis um, and eventually as we go on further there are chances in 75 percent of patients the patient might there might be a remission of pain where we eventually go back and reduce the dose like for example if we are prescribing 600 milligrams in divided doses a day we bring it down to 400 200 and we put a and later on we give them a you know maintenance dose let's say like uh, 200 milligram per day in divided doses one in the morning or one in the night or sometimes we even manage with a very mild pain uh, where a patient has gone into very good remission where we use we have maintenance dose of 100 milligrams uh, per day but there are conditions where uh, the remaining uh, 20 or 25 percent patients where the intensity might actually build up and you might end up actually increasing the dose after a certain uh, period of time uh, so this all comes with uh, you know when you uh, constantly recall the patient and keep monitoring the patient so it is not a one one time or a one stop treatment uh, treating trigeminal neuralgia medically is not a one time or a one stop treatment patient has to be constantly monitored recalled and continuously uh, prescribed uh, these drugs and uh, 
uh, surgical therapies do exist for these patients who cannot tolerate and become refractory who do not uh, uh, sometimes totally respond to uh, medical uh, treatment uh, where uh, there is extensive uh, damage to the nerve or uh, demyelination of the nerve mm-hmm. sometimes uh, increased uh, you know intracranial uh, hypertension can also uh, lead to this these are cases which has to be surgically approached and uh, coming back to uh, the medical management and uh, uh, very uh, uh, for neuropathic pain in uh, general uh, very invaluable uh, medication or uh, the tricyclic and uh, tricyclic antidepressant drugs uh, most notably am- uh, amitriptyline and uh, nortriptyline uh, these drugs are used alone in combination with uh, Uh, drugs such as carbamazepine and gabapentin but uh, doses far below than used to treat clinical depression so you will not generally go with the amount of the amitriptyline dosage that you are prescribing along with carbamazepine in terms of uh, trigem and uragia will not be the similar dose that uh, you treat you actually treat with uh, a treat a clinical uh, case of depression and uh, we generally go with uh, as low as a dose as uh, 20 mg in uh, uh, amitriptyline um and one thing that we have to remember when it comes to uh, usage of uh, antidepressants is that again it is not something that takes effect overnight that is uh, you cannot get rid of depression just because you took one tablet of uh, amitriptyline it's something that we have to build up for for the patient to, to show uh, you know uh, for the patient to show initial signs of uh, you know uh, reduction in depression when you treat with uh, antidepressants uh, the time frame generally is put is generally is roughly about 3 weeks to 1 month um, for the patients to show initial signs of reduction in uh, depression so it is a time taking another uh, time taking process when you combine these drugs and uh, although the exact mechanism sometimes uh, in 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 uh, Uh, the role of uh, this antidepressants in trigeminal neuralgia is unknown but uh, it is understood that uh, uh, it reduces the neuronal excitability and uh, pain perception and uh, uh, it is clear this uh, the drug re- the, the drug used in dose range for neuropathic pain or not treating a clinical depression or other primary uh, mood disorder minimally invasive treatment for trigeminal neuralgias include uh, percutaneous uh, glycerol or alcohol injection or radio frequency necrolysis um a toward an affected trigeminal division uh, previously in earlier days in the 80s or let us say 70s 60s uh, they used to inject uh, hot water uh, into uh, the ganglion area or the pain uh, area uh, which in some patients proved because it was a very popularly used then after the advent of steroids steroids were also used uh, steroids proved uh, beneficial especially in case of demyelination because steroid has a mechanism uh, somehow as to you know uh, uh, you know facilitate or prevent or uh, the, uh, the grazing or perception of pain and uh, common uh, side effects that are uh, variable or levels of anesthesia and territorial supplied by the treated nerve Uh, most recently uh, usage of something like uh, uh, gamma knife uh, you know have uh, been used uh, with the aid of uh, ct and mri uh, where you directly uh, you know kind of uh, uh, necrotize that uh, uh, particular nerve or uh, um, the blood vessel involved Uh, this is uh, similar to that of uh, treating an aneurysm uh, if you take a uh, uh, example of gamma knife uh, gamma knives are generally the most commonly uh, common use of gamma knife although it's a very essential you know you know it is a very uh, advanced mode of treating uh, you know uh, brain cancers and uh, other uh, carcinomas related to uh, the brain Uh, the most commonly used uh, it is most commonly used in treating brain aneurysms what you tend to do with uh, the gamma knife is that you shoot pinpoint radiation into the aneurysm and you totally you know kind of like necrotize or kind of uh, this thing 
because once an aneurysm bursts it is going to lead to intracranial hemorrhage and the patient is eventually going to go into various symptoms and eventually death so to prevent that you kind of like kind of like control that aneurysm uh, by delivering pinpoint radiation directly to that aneurysm that is what gamma knife at the present date is most frequently used for apart from treating uh, uh, you know carcinomas and uh, other parts uh, the same principle is taken there and uh, and uh, and is applied here in uh, our uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia also where you directly deliver pinpoint radiation to the blood vessel which is uh, uh, you know contributing to the demyelination or because it presses over and uh, due to intracranial hypertension you know tends to uh, kind of pulsate and uh, you know or maybe enlarge in size over a period of time the size or the uh, area is brought down into control using uh, radiation uh, with the use of uh, gamma knife and uh, um, um, fun fact and uh, is that uh, uh, if there are any superman uh, superman fans uh, out there uh, if you if you're an ardent superman fan that you know that uh, with this uh, x-ray vision or, or his, uh, heat vision he can actually perform a uh, intracranial surgery just by looking you through your eyes uh, you know there is some similarity when you talk about uh, gamma knife and uh, uh, the heat vision with superman uh, it is uh, very uh, you know it is very uh, astounding that uh, uh, comics uh, kind of figured a treatment out uh, you know uh, even before the advent of uh, gamma knife uh, prior uh. then we have uh, other facial uh, neuralgia such as glossopharyngeal neuralgia and the geniculate uh, neuralgia or occipital uh, neuralgia and uh, uh, which um, um, you know uh, which uh, glossopharyngeal neuralgia uh, the clinical features are generally uh, is similar to that of trigeminal neuralgia it shares a lot of features of trigeminal neuralgia with a few notable exceptions the pain location and the distribution of glossopharyngeal nerve and uh, specifically posterior part of the trunk and lateral oropharynx the pain is less intense and uh, that of trigeminal neuralgia and is still paroxysmal and episodic in nature and uh, it is provoked mostly by swallowing and uh, contact with the mucosa and the overlying region which is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve and uh, glossopharyngeal neuralgia is a very uh, rare disorder and uh, uh, it was considered uh, to have uh, to occur in uh, one in uh, hundred thousand and uh, etiology is because of uh, uh, more so than that of trigeminal neuralgia uh, it is it, uh, it, uh, it, it lacks uh, unifying etiologic theory but uh, most recognizable one is the underlying disease that may process similar to that of uh, that my proposed uh, trigeminal neuralgia diagnosis of glossopharyngeal neuralgia again is the same as trigeminal neuralgia where it is mostly clinical history and examination and it is very important especially in glossopharyngeal neuralgia that we rule out all odontogenic sources uh, before we conclude or bring down any contributing factors such as multiple sclerosis or tumors uh, uh, or any contributing factors for glossopharyngeal neuralgic pain uh, can be identified with uh, CT and MRI. Uh, treatment patient again is uh, responsive to uh, drugs such as uh, carbamazepine. It's almost similar to that of treatment of uh, uh, medically it is similar to that of treatment of uh, trigeminal neuralgia and uh, also treatment of uh, multiple sclerosis is taken on moving on to post herpetic neuralgia unlike trigeminal neuralgia and glossopharyngeal neuralgia post herpetic neuralgia is not paroxysmal neuropathy pain rather it's a continuous burning or stinging neuropathy pain that persists for more than three months in terms of distribution or, uh, uh, or outbreak of a herpes uh, zoster or shingle infection post herpetic neuralgia share uh, with other neuro uh, it shares other neuropathic pains, features of uh, hyperalgesia and allodynia. Except in rare cases um, of uh, herpes uh, zoster or zoster reactivation, without any associated lesions, the vast uh, majority of patients report an uh, antecedent uh, episode of uh, shingles. Since uh, herpes zoster, like other human herpes viruses, is a neurotropic DNA virus, 
uh, it tends to uh, remain dormant in the dna uh, if you remember well uh, we had a class on uh, um viral disorders which causes uh, vesic lobulus uh, disorders such as shingles uh, chicken pox and shingles we would have discussed that uh, especially the herpes zoster uh, variant of virus uh, they have the attribution of uh, attaching itself to nerve axons and uh, neurons and uh, hence remaining dormant for a time and get reactivated something with as simple as harsh sunlight or trauma or stress <clears throat> and man, man might manifest as you know it can re-trigger and can cause the same disease over and again secondarily or it might actually uh, lead to complications such as post herpetic neuralgia um, most causes of uh, most most cases herpes zoster is prevalent over 60 years of age and uh, and uh, the, the elderly are uh, found to be high risk than of uh, younger patients and uh, diagnosis for post herpetic neuralgia is generally like you told is based on clinical history and examination and sometimes uh, with uh, uh, previous history of uh, uh, viral infections and uh, treatment of uh, post herpetic neuralgia most commonly in patients over 60 year uh, uh, aggressive treatment that uh, we follow an aggressive treatment uh, at the earliest uh, opportunity and, uh, and uh, we treat them with along with uh, neuralgic components treatment of uh, neuropathic or neuralgic pain component such as uh, carbamazepine or pregabagabapentin phenytoin we also treat the patient with uh, antidepressants amitriptyline and most important component especially in treatment of post herpetic neuralgia lies the combination of uh, antiviral drugs such as acyclovir or famcyclovir and uh, so in recent cases uh, usage of uh, drugs such as uh, uh, corticosteroids uh, capsaicin uh, also been uh, you know uh, used in terms of treatment of uh, these pains and uh, post herpetic neuralgia when it comes to post herpetic neuralgia we can remember that uh, uh, now, uh, development of vaccine is way under process for uh, prevention of uh, contraction of uh, chicken pox. So, the important factor to be uh, taken into uh, consideration. Burning mouth syndrome uh, or uh, glossodynia is uh, currently defined as a condition where burning pain in the tongue or other mucosal membrane occurs in association with normal signs of uh, uh, normal signs or normal laboratory findings although there is no uh, clear uh, detectable pathogenesis for uh, burning mouth syndrome recent contract uh, recent concepts are uh, uh, you know kind of are affecting the manner in which clean clinicians uh, kind of understand and conceptualize the disorder and the way the patient is to be managed so when it comes to burning mouth syndrome and there is there are two concepts that needs to be understand okay burning mouth is one one uh, you know one uh, concept and burning mouth syndrome is another concept burning mouth is something where you can actually associate it with an existing pathology for example you can find it most commonly in patients with uh, after ulcers and uh, um, yeah, like something like a geographic tongue uh, which has been in migratory glossitis where you can actually physically see an existing or underlying condition which is contributing to burning sensation in the mouth whereas burning mouth syndrome is a condition where you can actually much of a detectable cause the local contributing factors to uh, um, burning mouth syndrome is generally uh, cost uh, is considered due to allergic disorders uh, salivary gland hypofunction that is uh, xerostomia and uh, chronic low grade trauma and parafunctional habits where systemically it is considered due to hormonal disturbances and psychological uh, uh, contributing factors such as depression because in one third of the cases have been found to uh, have depression associated depressive uh, associated depression and drugs uh, such as ADRs and uh, AC inhibitors uh, such as enalapril uh, have been found uh, to have an uh, you know kind of an adverse or a side effect causing
burning mouth and uh, uh, the clinical features uh, generally uh, lie that it is most commonly occurs in female and tongue is the most common site uh, followed by lip, lip and palate relieving factors are by eating candy candies or uh, uh, chewing gums uh, drinking waters and beverages to keep the mouth moist and treatment of uh, depression anxiousness and anorexia and uh, in most of the cases dysgeusia which is an altered taste sensation or abnormal bitter taste is also associated investigations again mostly rely on clinical and uh, history clinical examination and history and is also uh, by ruling out an underlying uh, disease uh, it is important that we also examine the salivary uh, uh, gland uh, associated salivary glands diabetes anemia and vitamin b12 deficiencies management of uh, burning mouth syndrome uh, start off with reassurance to the patient and counseling because like i said there is an essential psychological uh, component one in three patients have definitely show a psychological aspect to burning mouth syndrome so counseling plays again an important part drugs such as tricyclic antidepressants and uh, alpha uh, lipoic acid uh, systemic capsaicin capsules uh, topical anesthesis uh, and uh, topical clonazepam have been found very treatment of burning mouth syndrome moving on to painful post uh, traumatic uh, uh, neuropathy um, so uh, nerve injury is generally associated with uh, tissue injury that uh, results in a complex series of uh, uh, biodirectional events between the nervous uh, nervous tissue and the immune system there is this response is Uh, intended to promote healing it may out also result in pathologic events that leads to uh, persistent neuropathic pain these events might uh, include functional changes in the uh, central nervous system and peripheral nerve sensory processing and uh, as well as the uh, neuroma formation what sets the nerve injury and uh, neuroma pain apart from the neuralgia is the provocation of pain upon stimulation of a discrete region uh, innervated by the injured uh, nerve and this type of injury to trigeminal nerve, uh, nerve can be brought about by uh, in case of third molar impaction removal where there is transient anesthesia and paresthesia of lingual and intralingual nerve in, uh, implant placement removal of a cistern uh, jaw involving the trigeminal uh, nerve and its branches orthopedic surgery uh, example of genioplasty or osteotomy post rct and neurotic surgery and uh, facial trauma other uh, nerve injuries uh, uh, terminologies related to nerve injuries uh, we have to remember is uh, neuropraxia which is uh, which translates to minor nerve injuries and uh, uh, axonot uh, axonot disease where uh, there is degeneration of neural fibers and neuromesis where there is nerve section uh, that is permanent nerve damage yeah, causing yeah. um moving on to atypical odontalgia or atypical facial pain um uh, it's a it's not a very common disorder uh, or other diseases associated with uh, orofacial pain uh, such as uh, temporomandibular disorder its uh, importance is emphasized by its uh, chronic nature uh, resistance and treatment and the devastating effects it has the patient suffering from this uh, condition uh, their uh, patients with atypical facial pain often uh, consult uh, numerous dentists and physicians seeking an explanation and effective treatments because most of the time uh, it is it is not very easy for us to pinpoint the exact source for the source of pain in in in, in these cases um, a history of multiple ineffective treatment is very common in terms of atypical facial pain and uh, surgical treatments are often performed including two tooth, tooth extraction endodontic uh, procedures explanatory exploratory surgeries uh, sinus surgeries and uh, temporomandibular joint surgery or treatment related to tmj with uh, no effect uh, if, if if we take the history of this particular patient we will understand that the patient has 
uh, patient uh, has persisting pain even after undergoing various uh, forms of uh, treatment uh, alleviating uh, the pain uh, the uh, lack of uh, you know the uh, etiology and positive diagnostic criteria um, in, uh, you know um, has led to the name itself atypical facial pain and uh, and uh, there is a very good uh, correlation uh, between a typical facial pain and uh, psychological disorder it is a very important uh, topic that comes under uh, psychosomatic uh, disorders and sometimes it is also referred to as uh, phantom uh, tooth pain um, although phantom tooth pain is generally uh, a concept that is related to uh, post treatment pain uh where patient has pain post treatment uh in, in in to a certain extent phantom tooth pain also falls under the category of uh, atypical facial pain the clinical features uh, um, um, um or official pain uh, the incidence is generally seen in women especially most commonly in uh, post menopausal women uh, between 40 to 60 years of age the ratio for uh, incidence in female is more than that of uh, males and uh, the pain is continuous and or nearly continuous and usually does not have a clear association to any event or activity that might make it uh, worse because the patient will not have a certain trigger factor in atypical facial pain and uh, a pain can be unilateral or bilateral or can start on one side and spread to involve the opposite side uh, these are characteristically not locally physical or uh, imaging findings or uh, you cannot find any imaging findings in other side of pain the physical pain and the results of uh, diagnostic imaging and other special tests and consultations are usually negative uh, there is something called as local anesthetic testing which we generally use in most of this neuralgic neuropathic and atypical uh, facial pain uh, where we tend to uh, you know um, administer local anesthesia uh, starting from uh, topical and we go on and anesthetic testing uh, can be a very useful uh, uh, part of uh, work up when you study uh, neuro uh, you know neuralgic pain when it involves uh, you know uh, Uh, trigeminal neuralgia or atypical facial pain uh, usually it starts out with uh, uh, application of uh, topical uh, anesthetic agent in the area where patient uh, feels pain uh, followed by interligamental uh, deposition of uh, local anesthesia in the area involved then you start slowly blocking the nerve divisions with uh, local anesthetic nerve blocks uh, to see the extent of to see the extent as to where the nerve damage or where the manifestation generally occurs failure of anesthesia to extinguish painful symptoms such as that they are being generated from from a uh, proximal point and they are referred from adjacent tissues or arising from central nervous system in extreme cases sympathetic and other uh, autonomic nervous blocks are also uh, useful this local anesthetic uh, tests so in uh, conclusion it is uh, uh, um, atypical facial pain as uh, treated uh, like uh, any other pain uh, and uh, symptomatic treatment followed by sometimes uh, medications that we use uh, to treat uh, neuralgias have also been used in treatment of atypical facial pain since like i earlier early mentioned that psychological factor plays a very important uh, part in terms of uh, understanding uh, in terms of uh, as a contributing factor to atypical facial pain treatment of uh, psychological uh, factors such as depression anxiety with uh, tricyclic uh, uh, tricyclic antidepressants and anti anxiety drugs can prove very effective and uh, please read it up please read up the topics we'll have a very uh, we'll have another detailed uh, discussion about this topic whatever i've covered here Uh, i've tried to cover as much as possible uh, related to uh, uh, orofacial pain uh, briefly uh, we'll discuss uh, further more in detail if you need a better understanding uh, while we have a clinical session and uh, fortunately when uh, if you are uh, if 
uh, we, we actually come across a lot of uh, patients who come up uh, to the clinic with uh, trigeminal uh, neuralgia and other forms of neuralgia. Uh, last year, we even had uh, post-herpetic neuralgia. These days, uh, finding post-herpetic neuralgic cases is actually quite uh, rare because of the advent of treatment, uh, the advent of antiviral drugs that we have and the vaccines that are there to prevent it. Um, but then like uh, we have had the um, fortune of coming across these cases that uh, which you can actually see and uh, you know uh, learn directly from the patient and um, uh, when you come across such patients uh, uh, please correlate to what you have studied and try to find out what it is and we'll have a further more uh, discussion uh, you know a detailed or a brief discussions when we are posted clinically um, stay safe uh, have a great day. Thank you.